Well, good morning, guys. It's uh, April the 11th, uh, Sunday, and uh, if you guys are down here in Florida, you'll know we've had a really nasty weekend of heavy rains and storms and tornadoes around and high winds, so no fishing for me this weekend, unfortunately. Um, I'll try to get out there as soon as I can and make another fishing video, but I thought while I was stuck in the house this morning, I would go over the boat that I'm fishing out of. I know I've had a couple of people ask me about my boat, and uh, so I thought I'd show it and show you a couple of things about it and how I've got it set up. Uh, you know, it's uh, I tried to rig it up the best I could. I bought the boat uh, pretty much unrigged and uh, decided to rig it with all the electronics, trolling motor and everything the, the way I wanted to do it. So uh, I'll show you how I got my boat rigged this morning and uh, might talk a little bit about some settings on my fish finders and then I think I'll take you inside and show you guys how easy it is to make these crappie jigs of these hand tied crappie jigs that I use um, I'll show you the materials I use and uh, just how easy it is to do it really it only takes just a minute or two to make a crappie jig so uh, we'll go over that but to start uh, let's take a look at this boat I fish with in a uh, it's a 2020 Ranger uh, 198p and uh, I bought the boat I, it got delivered to me about two weeks after they shut everything down for COVID. So I've had it right out of year. And uh, so far I'm loving the boat. It's been a great boat. And uh, I don't have any complaints. Uh, when I first got it, I had a few little bugs I had to work out with, uh, uh, you know, I kind of had a leaky drain plug and some loose wires. So uh, once I got that worked out, I hadn't had a bit of problem with it. But let's take a look at it and I'll show you what all I've done to it and what I've modified to make it a better fishing boat. All right, I'm in my garage, guys. So my garage is a mess. I have not been cleaning the garage, but here's the boat I'm fishing out of. Packed away in the garage. It's a little over 19 feet. It just barely fits in my garage. So I have to put it in here in an angle. But we'll start up here. We'll start up here at the bow. So I've got a, I've got the 24 volt 80 pound thrust Ultrex mounted up here with uh, the built-in built-in transducer and uh, a 360 of course with my my live scope and I've showed you guys in one of the other videos the way I mounted my my live scope to my 360 shaft so this 360 shaft it was already mounted to my trolling motor and I didn't want to put another pole on the boat but I did want to be able to not just have it. I didn't want it fixed to the trolling motor shaft where it would spin all the time because I like to use my spot lock. But I did want to be able to have the boat spot locked when I was fishing brush piles, but still be able to move the transducer. And I can probably get about 90 degree, 90 degree movement out of it before I you know, can't turn it anymore and it start running into a problem there. But what that does is with that spot lock moving the front of the boat back and forth all the time because you know it's it's it, that spot lock is wonderful when you're you know casting it bass off out there 30 yards away um, but when you're trying to fish a, a a stump that's you know 25 feet in front of the boat that spot lock is just not going to keep you pointed straight at that stump it's going to be back and forth and you know it may stay in a in a you know five or so, so foot eight foot area but it but it moves back and forth quite a bit so what that what this being mounted my 360 shaft allows me to do i i just came up here and took a couple of clamps and clamped a piece of aluminum on it mounted a little a little pole that i had to it so that i'd have a handle and then i just loosened up the bolts on my 360 shaft bracket that holds the shaft still mounted a little piece of plastic here above it so it wouldn't slide down any farther but that allows me to now turn this thing obviously i got it clamped down so it's not going to turn while i'm sitting here at the house but um that's how i did it it works really good for me um you know could it be better maybe uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it but i like that it's compact it's it's kind of built into the electronics i have i don't have an extra pole i've got to carry around it's just kind of part of my trolling motor so it works really well for me and I think it, you know, I think it looks nice and as nice as, you know, you can have a boat look with 400 shafts and wires and, 
you know i had somebody fish with me the other day said so, said it looked like i was trying to land a spaceship with all electronics on this boat and i tell you it can it can get kind of crazy but i'm i'm kind of electronics nut I, I have a background in software so i've always been one to uh really use really use electronics i spent a lot of time ocean fishing and uh for years and years and years, I relied on my electronics to find fish. So when I got more into freshwater fishing again, it just came natural to get electronics and, and use them every way I could. But I think I showed you in my last video, I actually mounted this uh, live scope bracket to the transducer bracket that came with it. It came with a transducer mount to go on the back of your boat. And I actually took that and cut it down and mounted the bracket to that, mounted that to a plate so that now I can swivel the, when I put it in perspective mode, I can actually swivel this up and down to different angles until I get a better picture, which that's one thing that uh, Garmin did not do with their mounts that they they really need to to change. If they're gonna, if you're gonna use that perspective mode, you really need to be able to change that up and down angle as well. All right, so moving around the boat here, I've also got, uh, you guys have seen it in the videos, but I've got my, my Garmin um, 106 Ultra mounted up here. And it's actually mounted to a ram mount so that I can actually raise it up. So I can raise this thing up and get a little bit closer to me when I remember to do it. And then I've got a uh, Hummingbird Helix 10 down imaging mounted that's a generation three mounted to the to the plate here above below that and this is um, also this one's connected to my 360 and then of course then i've got my my garmin this unit this unit is run with heavy gauge wire directly to an amped 48 48 hour lithium battery with a cutoff switch and the reason i did that was because uh, early on, I spent a day fishing out on out on Lake Talcum uh, and just fished in one area in the wintertime. And I spent most of the day fishing there and it absolutely killed my, 20, my group 27 uh, cranking battery. Stone, just about stone dead. It would not, it, it was all it could do to lift my power poles, much less crank my motor. It wouldn't crank my motor. So I, I ended up having to uh, troll the motor in from where I was. Luckily, somebody gave me a, a tow for the last hundred yards it's been a long day uh, so i don't i will tell you i do not recommend mounting a live scope to your cranking battery just don't do it guys if you're going to get a live scope just go ahead and plan to get a separate battery to hook that thing to because it will absolutely kill your cranking battery you just you just can't run it off your cranking battery it's just not going to work and then my helix is also ran on a separate set of heavy wires to my cranking battery and it also has an inline cutoff switch so any electronics these days that you put on your boat you want to make sure you've got a, 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 a shutoff switch to the battery because they all draw a little current and, and most of the electronics you put on a boat these days tend to draw a little current all the time that 360 transducer wheel these units will and you will notice that as your boat sits in the garage you know all week or for however long it takes you to get back out to the lake it's actually draining current off your battery and if you plug it back up you'll see that it's that it's going down um, but that's how i got my that's how i got my dash rig it works really good i can three, see my 360 on there now on my 360 i have found and I, i'm not an expert on the i'm not an expert on 360 yet I, i've used it you know for a year year and a half or so to get the clearest picture, I have found that you need to slow the speed down on it. One day when I'm out on the lake, guys, I'll actually pull up and show you the settings. We're just going to talk about, a, about them a little bit this morning. But if you slow the speed down a little bit and bring your range in, I found with, with the side scans, with the Hummingbird units, with the side scans, and with the 360s, that if you'll bring that range in, you know, more in that 60, 65 foot range, you know, although that may mean may not be a you know a long cast for you bass guys, you're gonna get a clearer picture on that 360. If you slow that if you slow that ref refresh speed down a little bit, you're gonna get a clearer picture on it as well. Now on the side imaging, it doesn't seem like 
slowing that down a lot is not going to give you a clearer picture. Typically, I run that about, I don't know, about the same speed my boat's going. And I tend to find that I get a better picture with, with my boat when I am moving less than five miles an hour. Somewhere between three and a half to four and a half seems to be about my sweet spot on this boat for getting a, a nice clear side scan view. And again, if you want a clear view, you're gonna to have to run that side scan down about 65 feet. When you start getting out past that, it starts interfering with your view. Now, I'm talking about a Gen 2 side scan because I've had side scans since they first came out. So I still got one of the older ones on my boat. I also have a Gen 3 on here and uh, I have not used it that much yet because right now my Gen 2 is my favorite. So uh, I'm still learning about that. And guys, my light turned off in my garage. So hold on, let me get that to come back on here so we can see better. There we go. But you can see I customized the boat a little bit. That's my last name. Browning is my last name. You guys uh, haven't ever really said my name on the videos, but... Uh, I'm actually, my name's actually Brian Browning. Uh, nice to meet you guys. And, uh, you know, I wanted to customize my boat a little bit. So I got one carpet graphic. That's the only one I've got. And that's the one I put on my boat. It's not that I'm sponsored by Browning. I'm not kin to them. Wish I was. But moving back, you can see I've got uh, my side scan units. And we'll climb, let's climb up here in the boat. So we can get a better look at those. Oh, guys. Some of you guys might have noticed on my trolling motor when I'm out there fishing, I've got this blue piece of pool noodle on here. Let me tell you guys what that is in case you're going to buy an oil trek. So what what happens is I got the shortest shaft oil treks that I that, that that I could get for this boat, and the reason I did that is because it's still it's still got plenty of depth to get down in the water with this aluminum boat. But I don't like my I don't like my trolling motor shaft sticking way up in there because it, it hinders my casting ability when I'm bass fishing. It just gets in the way. And I tend to every now and then I'm not paying attention. I tend to smack the thing. But what I found is when you run this down closer to the to the head unit, what you got here on this mounting unit is you actually have a a tightening bracket here that allows you to keep this shaft from moving. It keeps the shaft from sliding down any farther. Well, this bolt. When this head is spinning, will actually catch this curled wire that runs to your to your head of your trolling motor. And I actually had it catch on that one day, and I wasn't paying attention, and it nearly pulled all of my wiring completely out of the head of my trolling motor. So I put this on there. It's kind of gotten worn down. I need to redo it, but I put this on there, and it actually put a little pad here to keep such a big gap on this bolt. To keep this cord when it wraps around from getting caught on this so bad um, i had it bulked up here would actually had this under it but i've over time it's kind of worn down so i need to replace it but that's what that that's what that blue pad is i've had a couple people ask me what that is but that's what it is it's just a just my little joy rigged way of of keeping that from jerking this cord out of here and out of it actually actually pulled it out of here too so i had to take this apart and get it all seated back in there so i didn't want to do that again so that was my fix for that. And guys, I do have the, the Hydrowave. Um, I'm gonna be playing with that, crappie fishing some. Guys, when they when they get schooled up this summer, we're gonna get on some of these schools with the pan optics. I mean, with the light, with that live scope. And we're gonna play around with the uh, um, Hydrowave. And we're gonna see if that thing makes any difference because I am not positive. I have bass fished with it for a couple years now. And I have seen times when the bass were schooling on shad that if I if I turned that on, it did seem like the fish would come up and school and bust the shad for a minute. And then they'd go back down. If it got calm and they quit schooling completely, it seemed like I could turn it back on. And again, they would come up for a minute or two. So it, it did seem like it made a little bit of difference, but I haven't been able to tell that it makes a big difference. But now that I can actually see the fish on live scope, it's going to be very interesting to experiment and see exactly how these fish react when I turn that hydro wave on. And I'll probably try to do the same thing with some schools of bass this summer too and see how they react when I turn on this hydro wave. I had, did notice on my 360 that it seemed like when I had that hydro wave on, the fish, the bass would come closer to the boat for a minute and then they would move away and go completely off my screen set at 60 feet. And then a few minutes later, they might 
they might move back into range. So it seemed like it kind of kept them in the area, but I don't know if it, you know, how well it was really working. But we're going we're gonna to play around with that some this summer too. And we'll, uh, we'll see if we can solve the riddle of whether or not a hydro wave really makes a difference or not. All right, so let's move back here. All right, guys, I want to show you probably, aside from being able to catch fish, probably one of the best things that I ever bought for my boat is this bad boy right here. That was about the best $150 I have ever spent. This is just an inexpensive bimini, black bimini top. And for whatever reason, it's black keeps it cool underneath it. It does not get hot underneath this black bimini top. But there are some big advantages to having this. And you're going to see me using this a lot as summer gets here because I hardly spend a day on the lake without this bimini top up. And I basically took this and mounted it to my bass boat, which a lot of people don't do. I guess they don't like the way it looks. But I tell you, it is absolutely the best money I've ever spent. I could I could not fish without this thing in the summertime anymore. It's just it's just incredible. But I actually took mine and the leg here that mounts to the boat actually usually sticks out about six inches or so. I cut that off and lowered this top a little bit so that it didn't stick up so high to get a little bit lower. And I actually mounted it on the boat so that when it's up, it comes to just about the front edge of my deck. Just about this leading edge of my deck is where the front edge of it is. So I can actually step up onto the front of this boat and have a big area up here to fish where that top is not in the way. But when I come back to look for fish or idle around the lake with my electronics, I am sitting under here in the shade, protected from the sun. And it is on a hot summer day, guys, <laughs> I guarantee you it is 15 degrees cooler underneath this bimini top than it is out on that front deck. And I, I can fish all day long on a summer day when most people by lunchtime down here in this Florida heat, they have left the lake and gone to the house because they just they just out there getting cooked alive and this bimini top will keep that from happening and the other thing that it does that a lot of people may not think about is when i get in here in this boat and i'm island around the lake looking for fish this is my where i sit on my console so when i'm sitting in here and a lot of you bass guys you know, I know you guys are stubborn because I fished tournaments for years, you know, just up until the pandemic started. And all you guys saw me with, uh, with my bimini top and my bimini top up. And it's, I know it made it easy for you guys to see me all the way across the lake and know where I was. But let me tell you, riding around out there practicing and being out there fishing, when I have that bimini top up, guys, it shades both of these units. So I can see... What I'm looking at, I can see the fish and the detail on these things way better with that top up and that bright sun than you can just trying to look at them with no shade over this boat. So a lot of times, it doesn't even have to be that hot. A lot of times I have that top up when I'm out searching for fish because it is shading these graphs and making it where I can see the detail that's coming across the screen a lot better. And that's a that's a little tip I give you guys if you know if you if you don't mind having that bimini top, there's some big advantages to it. So not only am I cool, but I'm getting a better look at the fish than you guys without that bimini top are. Now let me I'm gonna tell you guys a little secret too that may help you. So I know a lot of you guys probably don't get the best pictures out of your units. And I learned the hard way. If you can look back here on the back of my units, you'll see my wiring plugs are running straight to the back of my units. You know, most hummingbirds have a big old bracket that clips on there. Well guys, I was having all kind of intermediate problems with my with my electronics for quite some time. And a lot of times they would not have a good clear picture. Or they would shut off on me, uh, just all kind of gremlins. And what if what I found was, is that those connections, those big old clip on connections, they're actually keeping these plugs from getting all the way up on your unit good and solid. So you don't have as good a connection on the back of your unit with your power and your transducer wires that you think you do when you're using that big bracket. So I got rid of those, mounted my plugs straight on there, put a little bit of household silicone on the top to 
to glue them on so they wouldn't shake or come loose because I know you guys will say, well, you know, you're not going to be able to keep them plugged in, but that little bit of silicone I stuck up in there, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little bit of silicone stuck up on top of each one of those plugs that keeps them from moving. And since I did that, that helped me get a much better picture on my units than what I, than what I was getting for a long time. Now also, each one of these have their, they each one, each one of these has their own separate heavy gauge wire run into the battery switch into my cranking battery. So they are isolated on their own wires. They're not hooked together. They're not sharing power wires. The only thing that they've got in common is they're sharing the battery switch that is right next to my battery with a big heavy cable. So that is, that is the way I rigged that up. And, uh, you know, I added, a. I added the Mercury Smartcraft gauge, the digital one. I added that. I had them add that to this boat when I bought it. That was an install. And uh, and then I added a. It's, this boat has a four inch jack plate, and I actually had a. I got one of the um, jack plate gauges that shows how uh, digital how high my jack plate is is raised, and then of course the blinker trim so that I could trim the jack plate with the blinker trim and I can trim the boat with my hand trim. I do not use a hot foot. Um, I am not a fan of hot foots. I like to use the throttle on the building the boat. That's the way I've always done it and that's the way I like to do it. And uh, so I do not have that. All right, moving back. So guys, let me show you another thing I did to this boat. And I do this to all my aluminum boats that I've had. I had a bass tractor too. I don't know if you can look in here, but I have added plexiglass panels inside this live well to make an overhang. And I put a slot in it so you can still take the divider in and out and close the lid. And what that does is if, if you're out there fishing a tournament and you throw a bunch of bass in there, they can't come flying out and go out of the boat. And now even you guys are fishing out of a bass tracker or even one of these rangers, and uh, you don't have these and you fish bass tournaments, you know what I'm talking about. I used to have to stick life jackets on. I get a big old mess of big bass in here and I'd put life jackets on both sides of this thing and tilt the lid up and guard it anytime I opened it to keep fish from flying out of here and getting back out of the boat. So that was one of the things I added and it was, it was worth doing. It was very easy to do. I just drilled a few holes and uh, bolted them on there with some stainless steel bolts and uh, that worked out really well. All right, so guys, we talked about my bimini top. Now the other thing I did, I got two power poles on here, two eight foot sportsman power poles and a four inch jack plate. Uh, on these power poles, you'll see my, I, I put the power pole paddles. Um, I've, I typically keep mine, I, you know, I'm just learning these things. I haven't had the paddles that long, but I typically keep mine at kind of a straight angle like they are now. And a lot of times what I'm using that for is when I'm out there just kind of well, when I'm out there and the, and the wind's blowing, I, if any of you guys have these aluminum bass boats, the bow of these things blows around really bad. It'll, it, you, you, when you stop the boat and the wind catches it, it'll move that bow on you in a hurry. So a lot of times I put these down in the water just to add a little bit more resistance to that to keep it from spinning quite so fast. And it does seem like it makes a little bit of difference. I won't say it makes a huge amount of difference, but it does make a little bit of difference and, uh, I think enough that I, I'm not going to take them off and I'm going to continue to use it because I, I think it does help me a little bit. So guys, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the view of my boat. Um, I think we talked about most of what I've done, uh, different than other people may have on these boats. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's been a, it's been a really good boat. I've enjoyed it. I think I'm going to keep it for as long as I can. Uh, Ranger just makes a good boat and it's got good bones to it. The only thing I will warn you about is, uh, and shame on Ranger for this, and shame on all boat manufacturers. This is my rant. Boat manufacturers do not put a big enough conduit hole to run the wires through their boats that they need to for the electronics these days. The conduit pipe on this boat to run all those big heavy gauge wires to these units <laughs> is packed so full of wires that I don't ever want to have to change one of them again because I'd probably have to disassemble all the wiring in this boat and re-pull it to get, to get one more wire through that. Um, 
why in the world they don't put a, just a big old pipe to make it easy to run wires is beyond me. But they really, they really should design that into boats. They, they know people are going to put all put a lot of electronics on their boats, especially the big bass guys, and they really ought to make it easier for, for that to happen. But uh, like I was saying, I have a I have a Helix 10 side scan Gen 2 on this side and a Helix 10 side scan gen 3 on this side and i actually have ran both transducers to the back of my boat so i have a gen 2 transducer on one side one side of the boat and the gen 3 transducer on the other side of the boat and the reason i did that is for backup so when i was fishing tournaments all the time and i relied on those electronics a lot uh, spent a lot of time doing offshore fishing that gave me a backup in case i was ever having problems with one of them i always had an extra one to use i will say this though my for whatever reason, my Gen 3 side scan transducer has been buggy since the day I've got gotten it. It just just doesn't work very well a lot of the times. I don't know if I got a one that's got an issue. I have not wanted to try to pull it off and and have it worked at because like I you know have it looked at because like I said, trying to get that transducer wire back through this boat would require me to just about disassemble the boat. So I have uh, used that one as the backup, and I pretty much rely on my my Gen 2. And that's part of the reason why. But that's it, guys. That's that's my boat in a nutshell. If you have any questions, let me know. And uh, we're going to ease in here in the house. I'll show you real quick how easy it is to uh, type one of these simple crappie jigs. So hold on with me.